There are two essential components to quality observation. The first is you've got to learn how to read. The second is that you have to learn what to look for. You ever gone to a doctor with a sore throat? First thing he asks you to do is to stick out your tongue, take that depressive, and he looks and says, I've got it. Now, my friend, I can look in your mouth from now to eternity. I can't see a thing because in the first place, I don't know what I'm looking for. He does. Fortunately, God has provided us with an excellent tool by which to memorize the six things that you've got to learn to look for. Five of them, one for each of the fingers, and the sixth for the palm of the hand. The first thing you need to learn to look for is things that are emphasized. And the Spirit of God uses a number of tools to emphasize material. For example, sometimes it's the amount of space. Take the book of Genesis, 50 chapters. The first 11 chapters cover all of the creation, all of the development of the nations, all kinds of details, but they're all compressed in 11 chapters. But in 12 through 50, you got four individuals, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. So that the Spirit of God is teaching you that ultimately the most important thing in the book is the family that God chose to be His instrument to accomplish His purpose. You see the same thing when you study the Gospels. Always ask yourself, what is this Gospel writer emphasizing? For example, some of them take much more space to cover, for example, the crucifixion than they do many other events in the life of Jesus Christ. Another way things are emphasized is through the stated purpose. For example, in John chapter 20, in verse 30, we read, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So the writer carefully selects seven signs by which to prove that Jesus is the Son of God and that he is worthy of your placing your trust in him. A third way things are emphasized is by the order of the material. For example, it's this before that. It's this following that. A good illustration from the life of Christ is found in Luke chapters 3 and 4. In chapter 3, you have the baptism of the Savior. In chapter 4, you have the temptation. And notice the order. In the baptism, he is approved by God. In the temptation, he is tested by Satan. And the order becomes very significant. Another way that material is emphasized by a writer is that he will move from the lesser to the greater, and oftentimes will focus on some key information. From the life of David, 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12 are the most crucial chapters 
in David's life. That's where you have the rec recording of David's sin with Bathsheba. And it becomes sort of a pivot to the book. Everything before leads up to it. Everything after goes down from it. Or Acts chapter 2. You're studying the book of the Acts, and you discover that chapter 2 becomes a pivot chapter. It's the one chapter without which you couldn't have the book. Everything grows out of that. And it's the writer's way of emphasizing the material. Now, the second thing that you need to learn to look for, and that's things that are repeated. They may be terms or phrases or clauses. For example, in Psalm 136, you read, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of God. His love endures forever. Twenty-six times the psalmist says, His love endures forever. Now, why did he repeat it? You know, was he running out of gas? Did he have nothing else to say? No, he's emphasizing that his love endures forever. And by the time you get through the psalm, you know the bottom line. His love endures forever. What else do you need to know? Is what the psalmist is essentially telling us. Or take Hebrews 11. Interesting illustration of things that are emphasized. By faith, by faith, by faith. Now you have different people living in different periods of life, but all of them living by the same by faith principle. So when you study the scriptures and something is repeated, said more than once, mark it down. It's not because the person can't think of anything else to say. It's not because they're going soft in the head. It's because they are communicating a very important matter. A third thing that you need to look for are things that are related. And there are a number of kinds of relationship. For example, sometimes the writer will move from the general to the specific. Let me give you an illustration out of the Gospel by Matthew, chapter 6, a part of the Sermon on the Mount. The chapter begins, Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men, to be seen of them. If you do, you will have no reward, that is, of your Father in heaven. You will have a reward. You did it to be seen of men, that will be your reward but not observed by the Father. Then he goes from that general principle to give you three illustrations of it. First of all, in the area of giving, then in the area of praying, and then in the area of fasting. So he moves from a general principle to three specific illustrations. Another way that a writer relates material is by using questions and answers. You see this frequently in the book of Romans. In Romans, Paul writes like a lawyer, one, two, three, therefore. It's as if he's developed a tremendous brief. For example, look in Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning? so that grace may increase by no means. And then he goes on to answer that question. Look down in verse 11. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God. Verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? That's the question. The answer is by no means. And then he goes on to spell it out in detail. A third way that you can relate material, in addition from moving from the general to the spe specific, from questions to answers, is by cause and effect. In Acts chapter 8, I want you to see an illustration of this. Acts chapter 8, verses 1 and 4. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church of Jerusalem. You're forced to ask, what day? Why, the day when Stephen was martyred. 
That intensified the persecution. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. But verse 4 says, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. In other words, it was the persecution which was the cause and the preaching was the effect. Instead of saying, my, what in the world's God doing to us now? Here we prayed that he might use us and now we've got persecution. They used it as a means of leverage to get the gospel out to the ends of the earth. There is another, a fourth way by which we can observe, and that is you need to learn for things that are alike. I happen to have identical twin grandchildren, two lovely little granddaughters, and I love to take them for a walk, and it's fascinating to go to a mall because you are walking down, one on each side. I cannot tell the difference. Neither can their father half of the time. Only their mother seems to be able to distinguish them. And it's fascinating to walk down the mall and say, hey, look, look, yo, yo, twins. Because you see, the moment you see two of anything alike, your attention is immediately drawn to them. So as you're studying the scripture, these are the expressions you want to look for. Always look for as or like. You see, we're talking about comparison. So in John chapter 3, Jesus said, you must be born again. He's using a comparison. Just as you were born physically and received the equipment for this life, so you need to be born again spiritually to receive the equipment for eternal life. And that's why Nicodemus was so hung up. He's not a dumb individual. He's brilliant. But he says, how can I go through the birth process again? Because immediately he thinks only on a humanistic level. And Jesus says, you've got to be born from above, Nicodemus, or you'll never make it into the kingdom. And then he uses the expression, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So constantly look. You will find many illustrations of this in the wisdom literature and particularly in the book of Psalms. Constantly, as the deer pants after the water brook, so pants my soul after thee. A fifth thing you want to look for are things that are unlike. This is the use of contrasts of opposites. Again, in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, you read repeatedly, you have heard it said, but I say unto you. You have heard it said before, but I say unto you. Whenever you see a but, always stop and find what is the contrast being made. Paul uses it in Colossians. Put off the old man put on the new man. In Galatians, he says, The works of the flesh are manifest, but the fruit of the Spirit is. So you got a contrast between what the flesh produces and what the Spirit produces. The sixth and final one I want you to see, put it on the palm of your hand to help you remember, is that which is true to life. This is where you need to use your sanctified imagination. You need to use principles. Because, you see, we don't live back during that period of time, but the same things they experience, we experience. People are like us. These are not some cardboard believers, some stuffed shirt Christians that are being presented here. These are real-life people who face the same struggles, the same problems, the same temptations, the same successes that you and I experience. So I'm always asking myself the question, what were the ambitions of these people? What were their goals? What was the problem this person faced? How did they feel? 
Abraham is walking up Mount Moriah. He's got a son approximately 22 years old. The son says to him, hey, Dad, we got the wood, we got the fire, but where's the sacrifice? And you knew that the son was the sacrifice. How would you feel? See, often we teach this or we study it as if it, you know, were some academic thing rather than some real life thing. You remember in Genesis 22, God says to him, take your son, I mean your only son, I mean the one whom you love, the seed, and offer him up for a sacrifice. And he's going up that mountain, and he's asked that penetrating question, Dad, where's the lamb? Where's the sacrifice? How would you feel when you knew your son was the sacrifice? Let me give you just a few individuals that I think will help you see the scriptures in terms of life. Very true, very realistic. And what I love about the scriptures is that it's always realistic. It never paints them with whitewash. It always hangs the dirty wash out the front bay window if that is necessary to tell you what really happened. Take Moses. I mean, here's the incredible leader, the quintessential leader of all time. But he never gets into the land. Why? Because he struck the rock twice. One act of bad temper, and he's eliminated from the land. Or take Noah, this great man of righteousness who, together with his family, were saved through the flood. But he also got drunk, you know, stewed out of his mind. And you think, you know, how is this possible? See, the scriptures are not saying, let me paint this beautiful picture of a perfect individual. They're saying, let me show you a real life person. Righteous? Honored by God? Absolutely. And also failing. Also weak. Also sinful. Or take David. I think he's probably my favorite character to study. Brilliant and gifted in so many fields. He's almost the omnicompetent individual. I don't know about you, but every time I study the life of a person like this, I feel tremendous inferiority feelings. I mean, not only is he a great warrior, not only is he a great athlete, not only is he a great poet and musician, but he's also a great leader. He seems to have it all. And yet he's shot down in flame one day when he's home instead of out on the battlefield with the troop. And one woman wipes him out. Or take Peter. (laughs) I guess the reason most of us like Peter is that he reminds us so much of ourselves. You know, every time you want to uh, boot him around the block, you realize, good night, he's talking about me. And here's Peter. He's willing to take on a hundred men single-handedly. And one little gal comes up and says, hey, weren't you one of the disciples? He says, who, me? She keeps repeating it. I know you were one of them. He's saying, drop dead, woman. I don't know what in the world you're talking about. Until finally she said, I recognize the accent. You got a Galilean accent. You're one of the disciples. And he curses and calls down all kinds of anathema upon this individual. You back off and say, who said that? Why, the man who said, you can count on me. But at the moment of crisis, he failed. Or John Mark. You know, John Mark is one of those characters that you are liable to lose. He was on the second and first and second missionary journey. And you'll remember they were about to go out on another journey, and uh, Barnabas said, let's take John Mark. Paul says, no way. We're not going to take him. He flushed out of the last missionary journey. We're not going to run that chance again. And the text says they had such a strong disagreement. And by the way, don't water it down. Such a strong disagreement that they parted company. And it's not till the end of Paul's life that he says, bring John Mark. 
because he's profitable to me for ministry. Well, how in the world did he become profitable? It wasn't through Paul. It, th it was through Barnabas, who took him up and developed him and made him into the person that God could use. You see, when you study the Word of God, make sure you plug it into real life. And then you will discover these people are just like me. They are cut out of the same bolt of human cloth. So the next time you read your Bible, ask these six questions. What's being emphasized? Sometimes in one way, sometimes in another. What's being repeated? What's being related? What is alike in the passage and what is unlike? But above all else, ask, what is it that's true to my life that resonates with my experience as I study this passage? Mm -hmm.